And then uh, Tim Pruitt uh, introduced how the Bible is inspired, the accurate word of God. We can depend on it and know the truth there to help us get our mindset on God in the way that he sees things and to get our mind changed. And then um, we skip chapter 3, but we're going to get back to it, which will be coming up soon, the biblical creationism. Then last week, Amber Robinson and Tim, they covered the topic on the true nature of God, and they brought out about God's true nature and the love of God. And uh, each week, we are using scriptures to uh, demonstrate the truth of God's word and to check our thinking. Are we having a biblical worldview? And then we have a topic of uh, the fallen nature of man, which somebody else will cover. Not sure which week. But Don and I tonight are going to do the topic of identity. Why is identity even so important to talk about? But before we get into it, we're going to open up in prayer and so that our hearts are ready to receive and that we hear from the Holy Spirit and we're directed because we have 50,000 notes here, but we know we're just going to zero in on certain ones and we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. So join us in prayer. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord God, that tonight Don and I will share the oracles of you, God. Lord, I just pray right now that our hearts would be open and ready to receive your word, that our uh, minds would be transformed by the renewing of your word, Father God, that we would truly begin to um, hunger after our true identity that is in you and finding that true identity in your word, Father, and learning how to walk it out. Lord, I thank you for your anointing, and I ask for your blessing upon our time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So before we get into it, I just wanted to give a quick thought of why even teach about identity? Why is it important? Your identity, who you are, who you identify with, connects you to your purpose in life, where you're going, the choices that you make, why are you even here? So whether it's a worldview, it's going to direct you. Whether it's a biblical worldview, it's going to direct you. Many times people go through life. Who am I? Where am I going? Is there any meaning? <clears throat> so it's going to direct the course of your life. And if your identity isn't focused and you don't know what it is, you're going to run around confused and constantly trying to figure out what life is and where you should be going. You're going to have a hard time focusing until you settle in on who you are. Um, because your identity affects your wholeness, your whole personhood, your health, your mental health, where you're going. And what we want to do tonight is to help you to see, again, how important it is that you have to have a biblical worldview in order to know your true identity and who you are in Christ and the plans that he has for you and the purpose that he has for you. So we're hoping we're going to be able to challenge you with that tonight because once you really discover who you are in Christ you are able to fully recover who God intended you to be in this life and his plan and his purpose for you. It becomes that easier to walk out what he has for you. And there are some identities that people place on us. We have to deal with that. We're born into certain families. We can't change, you know, our skin color or the genes that are in us, and we have to deal with that. Um, we have to deal with the long-term identity with the fallen of man with Adam and, and what he did, and thank you, Jesus, he gave us the answer to work through that. But we get all these thoughts and other people's attitudes and ideas about who we are, but it's our responsibility to find out who we really are in Christ and live that out regardless of what anybody else thinks, and that's we find that in the Word. So, Tonight, Don is going to start us out with our first point, and there will be times we may reference to the board over there, and we put a few things up there so it makes it easier to look at. And he's going to go ahead with our first point. What is our true identity? Where does it come from? Well, point number one is we are a new creation in Christ. What happens to us whenever we uh, become in a relationship with the Lord all things are passed away all things are made new every sin you ever committed or every sin that you are going to commit in the future is covered under the blood of Jesus 
Our identity is in him. We really have to take comfort in that. In 2 Corinthians uh, 5th chapter in the 17th verse, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I can think of so many things in my life that if I were to let it, it could well up within me and discourage me. But I have to remember that when I repented and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that my identity changed, that I was made new, and that all, all of the sins I ever committed in the past were wiped away. My identity is in Christ. And that's the way it is when, with any of us. And we are a spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be blameless. Amen. You know, we... I don't care if we go out of this building tonight and commit a sin. The Lord has said he has forgiven it all. All we have to do is to repent and determine in our mind that we're not going to do that again. And if you turn around and do it again 10 minutes later, repent again. Our identity is in Christ. We are able to go before the Lord with boldness. Yes. Mm-hmm. With, with, I mean, pure boldness. I mean, sometimes I, I, in my growing up, I always thought I had to uh, go before the Lord and just, you know, lay down and face down to the ground, you know, and in all humility. But the Bible said you can approach the throne of God in boldness yes, because you have Jesus living in your heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we are made in the image of God. Imagine that. A lot of people can't, can't gr grasp that, but we are. We are made in the image of God. Genesis 1 and 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Amen. One day, we're going to stand before him, and we're going to see just what God really looks like. And I do believe that since we're made in the image of him, that he's going to look very similar to us. Amen. 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 God is a spirit. John 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. Or God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When I, you know, a lot of times when I'm worshiping the Lord and, and praying, I start to feel that connection, spirit to spirit. My soul and my body does not connect with the spirit of God, but my spirit connects with the spirit. The spirit is eternal. You'll always exist, your spirit. Is always going to exist. And when we reach heaven, our soul is going to be changed. Our body is going to be changed. We're going to take on an immortal body that's free from all sickness and all pain. And everything, you know, that we've ever suffered in this life is going to be wiped away. And it's just, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. It's going to be glorious. But I choose to keep my identity in Christ. Amen. Amen. So, whenever you go before the Lord, just always let your spirit take over. I've, I've been on my knees or, or walking around praying or sitting on my bedside praying many times, and then my mind go to wandering, you know. And I'm speaking words, but it's not really connecting. And I catch myself. And I say, Donnie, get your mind right. Get your spirit connected with the Lord because Amen. this body 
and this soul is not going to connect with him. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions, and it takes over many times. I, I don't know how many times in my life that I've let my emotions get away from me and got angry or something, and worst of all, get angry at her or something, and I'm always sorry that I did that, but that's what that soul does to you. If you can't keep it uh, in the Word of God, we have to uh, stay in the Word of God for our mind and will and emotions to stay in line with our spirit. And that is not always easy to do. But if we stay in that Word, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Always. So, so Don, you're saying we're uh, made up of three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. We have a diagram on there. Yeah. How about if you explain to the audience a little bit what that is we put up there that goes along with what you've been talking about? Right. Well, the spirit, that is your identity. And our true identity is in that spirit. And we have, we have to be able to renew our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, everything. To be in Christ. And we have to have a great identity in the word. We have to stay in that word. And whenever I've drifted away before and not stayed in the word, I've just grown off, you know, gone off and got cold and distant from the Lord. But in order for that spirit to stay strong, I have to stay in the word and keep and to keep my soul and my um, body in line with the word of God I have to do that like I said the soul is the mind will and emotions and the body has five senses and most of those senses if we're not careful can cause us to have a lot of sin and heartache in our lives um, our attitude Attitudes towards your spouse or attitudes towards your children or your grandchildren or attitudes even, even toward God. You know, if it's positive, you'll be made strong. If, you're, if it's negative, uh, then you're going to have a whole lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So, I, like I said to start with, the spirit is changed. Not your body and not your mind. When, we're, when our spirit becomes born again, doesn't necessarily mean that that soul and that body has changed. You know, I, I can remember whenever I was raised in a legalistic type of um, church, they believed that any unconfessed sin that you might have had at the moment of death that you would go to hell over that one sin. And it bothered me for so much of my life. I got to where I was uh, having an attitude, well, if I'm going to go to hell anyway, I might as well do what I want to do. But that was the wrong way to think about it. As I grew older, I'd come under some better teaching more, more correct teaching, I began to realize, well, I, I made a mention of that to Pastor Kurt when we were getting ready to leave Peru, coming back home, about my upbringing and that legalistic um, doctrine. And he's, he said, well, Don, think about it. There are so many sins that we have at times that we don't even realize, you know. Things, maybe just a thought, a sinful thought that we didn't think nothing of, you know, and just went on. He said, your, your sin is covered under the blood of Jesus. But I think that, that, that we should always be mindful not to go and sin willfully. Sometimes we sin unwillfully. But that, 
I think I might be starting to ramble. but. <laughs> 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 so we have to have our minds renewed. Amen. We become born again. We're a new creation the mind in Christ. Has got to be renewed. You, uh, you can't. You can't just say, "Well, I'm saved now." Uh, and I've seen this happen with a lot of people. They say, "Well, I repented. I got saved." But they go on and they keep doing the same old things they were doing before. That's because they haven't gotten in the Word and renewed their mind. To the word of God. So it's a struggle. Our it's flesh struggle. wants to these, get in there. These, so we have a struggle of trying to get it under control. Senses, yeah, it messes with us. Mess you up if you don't. If messes you don't with our mind, our will, and emotions. Amen. Which we need to go back to the spirit of who we are in Christ, knowing who we are. Yeah. How do we? How do we actually do that? Well, what does the word say, Don, in Romans twelve two? Oh yeah. You got that. You want you want to read that, or you want I'm not me to sure read I can it? Quote it. I know what it says, though. But it's let's see. I think I do have it. Got in it. Scripture. Um, yeah, there it is. There you go. And then I'm I'm going to read another version after you read it, just so we can hear another <laughs> okay. form of it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We can't conform ourselves to the world and expect to receive the blessings of the Lord. We have to uh, be conformed to the Word of God. Let me read this version here. This is the Kingdom New Testament version. thought it was interesting. It says, What's more, don't let yourselves be squeezed into the shape dictated by the present age. So if we're talking about a biblical worldview, are we allowing things to squeeze us into the shape of the world rather than into who we are in Christ, our true spirit. It says, instead, how are we going to fix it? Be transformed. Transform means you're totally changed. How are you going to do it? By renewing of your minds. Why? So you, you can work out what God's will is, what is good, acceptable, and complete. We can't know God's will and how to work it out and which way to go if we don't have our minds renewed. If we're just thinking the way the world thinks rather than going to what the Word of God says, we don't always know the right answers. We have to go to the Word of God and find them out. We think we do sometimes, but not. And then that's when we end up depending on our flesh, and then it shows up um, wrongfully, and we continue to struggle with it because our mind hasn't been totally changed. Um, Don, did you have anything else to say before I move on to point two? Okay, so let's talk about, so if we're going to renew our mind, first, one thing we need to recognize is um, the devil is out there to mess with you. He wants to mess with your minds. He wants to get you to think things that aren't right. Um, I was looking at one thing that explained a little bit just even the plain, simple word of devil. And if you went back to the Greek and you broke it up into the two parts, um, part of it meant penetration, part of it meant to throw or strike or ensnare someone. So the devil, basically, what he wants to do is he wants to penetrate you with the lies, and he'll keep throwing them at you and throwing them at you until he penetrates you to a point where your resistance gets worn down. And he'll do that with thoughts, he'll do that with lies, which goes back to, because he's going to penetrate that object, and that object is your mind, okay? So when we take the Word of God, we let that penetrate our mind, okay, instead of the devil, because what ends up happening is if we have those lies or those thoughts coming at us and we spend time on them, and it keeps bumping us and wearing at us and pulling us, pretty soon we're just like, oh, we quit. We give up, we get worn out, and we give into it. Well, it must be true. It keeps coming back over and over and over instead of taking it and testing it against the Word of God. Because whatever you believe about yourself, whether you're hearing it from the enemy, the world, or the Word of God, that becomes your self-perception of who you are. So we have to choose, are we going to look at what the Word says, who we are in Christ, and that becomes our perception of who we are. That's where we make our decisions because God wants our mind. He wants it to renew. He knows the enemy is out there to mess with us, okay? And 
if the devil can get in there in your mind and mess with you and your true identity, then he can turn around and oppress you and pull you around like a puppet. And we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And that is not who we are. But we have to learn to recognize that. So <clears throat> otherwise he can mess with us. And um, I'm sure you can think of many times when uh, you heard a lie and you totally believed it. And then later on you found out it wasn't. And did not what you believed, you acted on that. Just like there we've got soul there. Whatever's going on in your mind, your will and emotions is going to show up on the outside. But what is your resource? Um, there's a, so what is really going on in our mind? Let me, um, let's see, I had a couple points I was going to make here. Let's see. 50 million things. You know me being as a teacher, I've always got a million things. So let's focus on our thoughts a little bit here, okay? So what exactly are thoughts, okay? We have thoughts all the time, right, Don? You have thoughts all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Did you know that, depending on how active you are, you can have up to 45,000 thoughts a day? Whoa. Take that back for a minute to slow down and even think about that. Of course, us, us women that we like to talk and think about, you know, the guys could probably blame us. Yeah, you guys, you know, you never shut up, you know. You just got something going on all the time, you know. <laughs> it's always messing with you. Okay. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, those are just natural things. Now, whether you're, those thoughts, you take them and you're very optimistic about things or you turn them into being very pessimistic about everything or whatever else is in between. But um, each behavior that shows up in your body starts many times with a thought and where is that coming and how much time it is. You know, scientifically speaking, when those thoughts come in your mind, there is an electrical response that happens in your brain which is kind of what we have on the board there in the purple there, you get a thought, whether it's negative or positive. There's an electrical response of waves that travel in your brain. And then those, whether it's positive or negative, create your emotions. And then your emotions turn into attitudes, and your attitudes turn into a behavior. So stop and think. Take a minute right now and just think of a really good positive thought about yourself any kind of positive thought don can you think of a positive thought about yourself okay i could have a positive thought i am a teacher i teach kids all day and they are awesome all of a sudden my emotions start feeling really great about my kids and my students okay and i have a great attitude i'm ready school starts next week i'm so excited yeah yeah so i go into the classroom i get everything ready and i'm all pumped up and it affects my behavior. Or I could be a little bit negative, right? And I could say, school starts next week. I'm not ready. Summer's already over. Oh, I got so much studying to do. I got to do all those lesson plans. We're having a meeting every day next week. When am I going to get into the classroom and really make it like a, oh, and it's negative, and it's feeding me negative emotions. And it affects my attitude. I walk in there on Tuesday, oh man, how long are we going to be in this meeting? We're going to watch another video on CPR and you know, all this other kind of stuff. It affects your behavior. You have a choice of what you're going to do with your thoughts. You have a choice if you're going to meditate on the Word of God and get your mind renewed and have those positive things and know who you are in your spirit, or are we just going to take what our neighbor tells us, and what our parent says, our spouse tells us, What'd you do that for, you idiot? You know, and they go, an idiot, an idiot, an idiot. It's going over and over in your mind. You're like, I must be an idiot. I wouldn't have done that. Oh, man, I'm an idiot. <sighs> and, and you start thinking that, and you start beginning to believe it. You say it enough in your head, you're an idiot. We can control what goes on. God wants us, and we have been so structured to keep uh, believing certain things. We can actually... Um, Renew our mind, rewire it. The Word of God says to set our minds on the Word, okay? We need to identify those negative self-talk things that come along, identify the good things. Are we going to um, always expect the worst when a situation comes up or you hear somebody negative? Are we going to think of the negative side of it or are we going to be more optimistic? We have to make a choice, right? Um, 
The good news is when you have a lot of negative talk and you're dealing with it, it can be reversed. I want to show you something here. A little silly display here I made. <laughs> now, I couldn't, I didn't have to, I was going to get something that showed like the real brain or science and I was going to get off Amazon and then I didn't. So, so let's just imagine that these wires are inside your brain instead of outside. Okay. They're all, they're all different colors. Okay. Right. Okay. Those uh, wires represent different thoughts. Okay. Black ones may be negative thoughts. White ones, pure, the word of God, thinking on things that are lovely, pure. Okay, that scripture, right? Okay, maybe the other colors are just fun, weird ones. Um, you got some dark ones. But every time you have one of those thoughts, they're just... Now, let's uh, take, for example... Let me see. I got some different colors here. Becky, you want to help me? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Think of a negative thought. Think of a negative thought. Come on up here. Two seconds. You're just going to stick this in his head. Yeah, you want to do that. Okay. I'm going to give you a black one. I want you to think of a negative thought. Bills. Bills. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, okay. Okay. So wait, wait, wait. You can't go away. You're not done. Ah, oh, bills, having it. Okay. So what happens next? You're thinking of the bills. Oh, your emotions. So what emotion might go with the bills? Stress, anxiety. Stick it in there. Oh, oh, an attitude. What's your attitude that would happen? Anxious, mad, sad. Oh, nervous. Stick it in there. Stressed. Okay. All right. So, what behavior might show up if you're all that negativity is going on in there? Mad. You might get mad, angry. Maybe holler at somebody. What you spend so much money for? I don't have enough money to pay the bill. <laughs> Who knows? More negative. Before you know it, the brain is feeling all this darkness, darkness, okay? So what could you do different? How could you renew your mind? What could you do? Do you happen to profess your scriptures? Now, I know you're on the spot, but can you think of one that would be positive that might help you? Be anxious for nothing. Thank you. Get up here. Here, help me. Help me. <laughs> okay. So be anxious for nothing. So she could put, little put that in there. It's a white one. That's a good one, you know. But then she's got to say it again. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for Pretty soon, a bunch of white ones, right? Lots of them. Pretty soon, you're not going to see these. These black ones are going to be dead because they're not being used anymore, those wires. And the more she keeps saying, be anxious for nothing, she is renewing her mind in Christ Jesus, and she is getting rid of the other ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the more you, your brain, the actual connections that go on there, you can rewire your brain actual physically. This is scientifically proven. Okay. So when you're dealing with those negative things, the more you think about them, and the more you keep speaking them, um, the more those little black weird things are going on in there. If you stop and you start renewing it with what the word says instead, you're going to create a different pathway, a better pathway, and you're training your brain to think new and differently. That's why we keep saying, say your scriptures, say your scriptures, speak them out loud over and over and over because you're wanting to renew your mind of the old ways that you're thinking. Does that make sense? Okay. You, it is, it's not just, oh, the Bible says to do it. It's, this is the way God created your brain. He told you renew your mind because he knows how the brain functions. He created it. Right? He created it. Okay. Um, so, thank you, Becky. That was very helpful. Okay. So um, when we get our mind thinking and renewed to what our true identity, who Christ says that we are, um, I was just seeing, I thought I skipped something. Where are we at? We're on track here. Are we on track? Uh, our true identity in Christ uh, connects us with God's um, specific plan, his purpose. 
Okay. Um, Don, I don't want to uh, run the show here. Mm-hmm. I just made a big point there. Do you have some things you want to insert with what we're talking about? Well, I had on the, uh, I forgot this one particular point on point one. But okay. It can fit in with point two as well. Go ahead. Uh, walking in the spirit or our true identity. As a young man, I struggled with trying to serve God and, like I said, under a legalistic system. And uh, like I told Lori last night, I probably got saved three dozen times, you know, when I was a boy. But uh, truth is, I was saved all along, just didn't realize it. But uh, when, when I'd stumble, you know, my spirit was not made strong in the Word like it should be. I'd read the Bible, but I re- wouldn't really get it in here, you know. You know how it is sometimes you read something. It happens to me a lot of times when I'm reading a book or even reading the Bible. When I'm through reading it, I think, what did I just read? And I have to go back and read it again and try to concentrate more on it. But anyway, getting down to the nitty-gritty of the story, um, as a preteen and a teenager, I went to church as much as I could, but my motives were not always right. Sometimes I'd go there for friends or girlfriends. Sometimes it was one-sided, you know. (laughs) Just my attraction to them, but they weren't attracted to me. But my spirit was not getting right and in the Word of God like it should have to renew that mind, that soul. But whenever I was, say, about 18, almost 19, I started to really get into it, you know, into church for the right reason. And lo and behold, would you know that the right woman for me came. When my mind got right, when it wasn't right, there were five or six girls that I thought I might end up with when I was grown, but I don't even know where they're at now, don't you know, I don't want to say I don't care. I hope they did well. But what I'm trying to say, when the spirit got renewed, God put the right woman in my life. And, uh, it, you know, she's helped keep me straight all these years. She's got to be a good woman. Put up with me for 54 years. <laughs> 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 so anyway. Okay. Well. It, it, oh, get, go ahead. it gets right down to the point. If you get your spirit right, your soul and your body will line up with it. If you don't, then, you know, that's enough. Okay. I had a, uh, just a couple of scriptures uh, that go along um, with that one point about um, having thoughts that aren't biblically based and struggling with our identity of who we are. If you want to jot these down, I don't know we'll have time to look these up much, but <clears throat> some of them you're very familiar with um, that you can use to remind your, to meditate on. Um, the typical one of John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. So when you're having one of those thoughts, ask, meditate on it and ask yourself, this thought that I just had, Will it steal something, kill something, or destroy something? How is it going to affect me or somebody else? Um, When you have a thought about somebody, maybe you want to judge them or have an attitude about them, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18 talks about not knowing man after the flesh. Okay, That means who they are in the flesh. We are to know people by their spirit, who they are, okay? You might not see something they like. Something's going on with them. Either their mind isn't renewed or they're not a believer. Um, that's not, if they are, are a Christian, maybe they don't know who they are yet in Christ, and we need to focus on and maybe help remind them who they are in Christ and not pick up on their negative attitude and um, pick it up on us, but begin to know them who they are in Christ. Um, we have in John 14, 1, 
supports that we have the ability to control our emotions because Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Okay? If we didn't have control, he wouldn't tell us. There, you have the ability to not let your heart be troubled when you're having these thoughts and they're getting down in you. Okay? He has an answer for you. 2 Corinthians 10.5 is about casting down imaginations and um, things... Uh, Knowledge. That's, let's let's look at that. Second Corinthians ten five. Second Corinthians ten five. Just so I don't misquote it. Hmm, okay. <clears throat> All right. Talks about. Um, Though we, you know, we're, we may be in the flesh, we don't war as in the flesh, okay? We, it's by our spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Those negative thoughts can become strongholds. If you're thinking on them all the time, they, you become a prisoner to them. And you give into it, and you feel like, I can't get out of this. I can't get out of this. I'm caught. I'm caught. The word tells us that we are to cast it down. Cast out the arguments, the things that are going on in your mind that are negative, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If you're putting that above what the Word of God says that we're supposed to think on and the positive thing, you are exalting it against God. You, you're, you're saying you know better than God. Bringing every thought, that means check every thought that you have, good or bad, into the captivity, to the obedience of Christ. Does it line up to what the Word of God says? Check it. You have a thought, hmm, does this line up with the Word or does it? I don't know if it does. Get in your Bible and find out, right? Um, and being ready. So that's just a reminder there that um, we do have to deal with thoughts and imaginations, and we have to test them against the Word of God, whether they are... And if they're not, then we need to get rid of it and don't even entertain it. Okay? And uh, let's see. Okay. So, our true identity. Don's been saying we're going to find out who we are in the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. we got to find out who we are in the Word of God. All right. So, Jesus is an example for us. Okay? He was even challenged with his identity. How many in here are familiar with uh, Jesus being tempted out there in the desert before he went into his ministry, right? Okay. And I think we've even heard it preached many times, right, Don, about what Satan said, huh, oh, you're the son of God. If you can, you know, do this, turn this uh, stone into bread, all right? He was challenging, trying to get Jesus to not know who he was, but he did know who he was, okay? And even all the way to the cross. What happens on the cross again? ha, <laughs> ha. If you really are the Son of God, come on down from that cross, right? So from the beginning of his life till the end, Jesus came, was God as man. He had to figure out his identity, and Satan attacked his identity. Not any different for us, but he gave us an awesome example. He knew who he was, and that's what he allowed him to stand firm. How old was he when he went into the temple, Don? Do you remember? 12, okay? How many are familiar with the story of him going into the temple, right? Yes. He was 12, got left behind, parents been traveling, he, they find him in there asking questions and everything, and his mama says, what are you doing, you know? Basically, these are Lori words, okay? And he's like, I'm about my father's business. He knew who his father was. He, at age 12, he already began to know his identity, Okay? He didn't have his mama running around, sitting there um, at the Starbucks table, and everybody else is bragging about their kid, how they're the best baseball player, and they can do 100 push-ups, and they hit a home run, and all this kind of bragging about their kid. Yeah, that's what my kid is. He can great. No. She kept everything in her heart. She didn't, go, she didn't tell him who he was. Okay? He had to figure it out himself. And by 12, he was already figuring it out. Okay, so if you um, go to Hebrews 1, 10, 1 through 7, real quick, because this again shows where Jesus 
found himself in the scriptures. Uh, why can't I find it real quick? Uh, let's see. Hebrews 10, 1 through 7. Okay. So Jesus is... Uh, talking here and quoting and in verse 7 it says then I said behold I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will O God so it's talking about the scripture there he saw that it was written of him in the scriptures the volume meaning the Old Testament he saw himself in the scriptures and in Luke um, in John 539 You search the scriptures, this is Jesus talking, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. These are they that testify me, the scriptures. So he's, he's revealing the scriptures testify of me. So evidently, as he was raised, as a Jewish young boy, he was constantly reading the scriptures. He began to see himself in the scriptures, and he's able to tell other people, the scriptures testify about who I am. Can we do that? Look in the scripture and have the Lord reveal to us, that's me. That's me. Have you ever had a situation where the Lord gave you revelation of a scripture, gave you an answer, and you're like, that's for me, that's for me. Well, Jesus was doing that. Okay. And then if you want to go back and look yourself in Luke 24, 25 to 27, he explains to the disciples, this is after he's risen, from the dead, and he explains that throughout the scriptures, and he goes all the way back to Moses, and he explains to him, look at the prophets, look at Moses, okay? That's, do you not understand that? That's who I am. It's revealed to him. He knew who he was because he could see himself in the scriptures. He had to learn that. He had to figure that all out, but he did. We need to figure that out. Can we figure that out? This is one thing, Don, that the Lord's really been challenging me on, and that is, who am I? I mean, I've, I've had some moments this last year, I'm like, okay, you know, on the outside, you kind of want to label yourself, okay, I'm a teacher, I'm a mom, I help at the church, and this is who I am, but the Lord's been dealing with me more on the level of, who am I in the spirit? What is my real identity? And if it's in the word, I'm like, okay, God, you have to show me. Okay, show me who I am. I want to see it. Teach me, show me who I am, because right now I don't feel like I match up to other people. And then you kind of try to compare yourself. Well, yeah, I'm kind of like that. Or, well, maybe that's me or maybe that's not me. And he's like, mm -mm 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 -mm. you can find yourself in the word. I'm like, okay, fine. Help me out. Help me out. Well, one thing the Lord has shown me and that as I've been uh, going through Jeremiah 1, he's been using that a lot. But when I read through Jeremiah 1, and there's different things over the last few years, the Lord has said, that's you, that's you, certain things I would see. Well, I read through Jeremiah 1 again this last week because I thought, well, I'm going to look at some things I knew the Lord showed, was starting to show me who my identity is, and I'm seeing it in the Word, and I asked for him to do that. And as I was reading through it, I got another revelation. And that was that, in general, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 1. I'm not going to read through it all, but I just want you to follow along quickly. You want to follow Jeremiah 1 there, Don? Maybe you can see it here, too. But um, if you get in Jeremiah 1, that first chapter, uh, it'll talk about how the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to him. It'll t say in the first uh, couple verses, 1 through 3, it also came to him in the days of Jehoiakim and then until the end. And basically what I was seeing in there is, you know what? The word kept coming to him at a certain time in a certain place. And the Lord will come to you with a word at a certain time in a certain place to begin to reveal things to you. 
And the one scripture that we hear quoted all the time, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Right there in that one scripture, God is saying, I already had everything planned out before you were ever even born. Okay? I sanctified you, set you apart. You know, I've ordained you. You're, you're anointed. And, you, and guess what? You're going to be a prophet. And who you're going to go to is the nations. Right there, boom, he's telling them who he was before he was ever born, what kind of a person he needed to be, and who the people he was going to go to. Okay? So um, he's telling them he's got the plans for them. And, of course, you know, Jeremiah right away there in uh, the next few verses down, he's like right away, oh, Lord, I can't speak. I'm just a youth, you know? And God corrects them, hey, wait a minute. I already told you what you're going to do. And if you look up youth, it, it means more inexperienced. He's like, I can't do that. I'm experienced. You know, myself, when the Lord was dealing with me on some stuff, I was like, you want me to do what? I don't know how to do that. Okay, have you ever had the Lord tell you to do something? You're like, i never done that before. Don, I've never taught with one other person up here before. That was us tonight. Okay, I've never done that before. Uh-oh. But you know what? God's like, you know, don't say that to youth. You know what? You're going to go to who I send you to, okay? And I'm going to command you, and you're going to speak what you want. So don't fight with God. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> so it says, do not be afraid of their faces. So he knows he's going to deal with fear. We all deal with fears. When God begins to show us who our identity is and what we're called to do and where to go, ooh, you got those little fears come up. Ooh, those negative thoughts keep going. I can't do it. I can't talk. I'm so nervous. I can't. You know, and you, you rationalize things, right? Okay. And uh, so look at uh, down in Jeremiah 1, 9. It says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. You know, God will personally touch you with the word of God and give you the words to speak when you need to go speak somewhere. Um, he will... He, he knows you so well, he will do whatever it takes to make it very special or personal to you. And um, I've had that happen many times, whether it be a scripture, you hear something um, specific. <clears throat> so then the other promise that God does for us as we try to discover our identity in what we're going to do, he's not going to leave you hanging. He's going to give you a vision. And he's going to tell you what to do. So here it says, um, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? So he's giving Jeremiah a vision, some things to see. God, when you open up that word and God begins to reveal to you who you are, you will, in your imagination, you'll begin to see some things. And at first you might think it's kind of crazy. Okay? But... He just was honest with God. Look, this is what I see. I see a branch of an almond tree. And he says, you've seen well. And he continues to give him more things. And if you continue to read down through Jeremiah, he even begins to explain to him what he's going to do, where he's going to go. He assures him with understanding and details. We don't have to be afraid to find out who we are in Christ and where we're going the plan and the purpose he has for us because he's going to prepare you. It's our responsibility to have a part in it, okay? He even tells them in verse 17, Therefore, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. So he's telling them, you have a job to do. I'm telling you what to do. Get up and go do it. Get prepared Whatever it is, there's things I know the Lord has shown me to do, and I'm like, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Well, you can't do it if you don't get up and prepare yourself and get ready. Amen. You know, it's not just going to whoo, psychologically, weirdly come down and, oh, you can do it all of a sudden. There are some practical steps and things you have to do sometimes, and you have to say, God, okay, this is who I am in you. I can't quite see it, but what's the next step to get there? What should I do to help prepare me and to get better to get where I'm going, okay? So you're going to be a teacher, like you became a teacher, okay? You couldn't just walk into the classroom, right, Robin? You had to get prepared. You went to college, you did your courses, you did your student teaching, boom, 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 before you walked into that room. And even then, your first year, you're still doing things to prepare, to get better, and to, you know, and then, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, if you're still a teacher, 
I mean, you will have this whole identity of, she's the best teacher in the world. It didn't happen overnight, right? You kept preparing and planning and that. So, But God is always there. So what does God say to uh, Jeremiah? He tells him to get up on his feet and get going. And then in the end, he reassures him, Don. He encourages him. He says, hey, for behold, I have made you this day. He's comparing him to a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land. He's reminding him who he is and his strength and who he is. And when we're reminded of who we are in the spirit, we stand on that strength of who we really are and what God's called us to. Um, he's able to come against the priests. And he, he warns them. He says, hey, you know what? They're going to fight against you. Okay, you're going to go forth in what I said. They will fight it. But he says, you know what? They're not going to prevail. You know why? I'm with you. And I'm going to deliver you. God is always with us, whatever he calls us into. And that. So he wants us to be prepared. So... Don, I'm sure there's been some times you had struggles trying to go forward with your thoughts and um, really knowing who you are, and you've had to get the Word of God to try to straighten you out. And um, do you have any last thoughts you may want to share? Yeah, um, I can remember, oh, I think it was uh, 2015 when Pastor Kurt taught the Foundations in Christian Growth class here. And I, I didn't think I was doing so well on it, but he did. And he said, I want you to teach this class. I said, what? You know, I, I don't know if I can teach or not. I said, I can learn. I'm, I'm, I've, you know, been, when I tried, I've been a decent student. But um, he said... I can see it in you that you have the ability to teach. So I went ahead and I did it just like he said. Then before you know it, he wants me to speak on the Tuesday night service. We were having service on Tuesday night back then. And I said, oh, no. I said, I'm used to speaking to six or seven people. I, and at that time, we had 40 or 50 people coming on Wednesday night. I said, I don't know about that. I said, I'm used, I told him, I said, I'm used to speaking to just eight or ten people. He said, Don, there is no difference in speaking to ten people than there is to speak to 10,000 people. And when he said that, I just about choked. But anyway, <laughs> it's true. If you have the Spirit of God in you, your, your uh, identity in Christ is uh, founded and, and you're in the Word of God, you can speak to a million people. God gives you that boldness, you know, if you just surrender to him. So I had to go through a learning period then, and uh, I still yet haven't spoke to 10,000 people, but <laughs> who knows, the day may come. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So just uh, on uh, one last note, okay? Okay. When you are trying to figure out who you are in Christ, obviously we go to the Word, right? But it's also okay to use other resources. And this is what the Lord has been doing with me, some good practical thoughts and ideas. So I know that the Lord's dealing with me on my thoughts and my process and to believe who he really says I am. And I have to deal with thoughts how am I going to, what am I going to do? I, me being a teacher and educator, I look to the word for the truth, yeah, but there's that part of me, I want to know more, I want to know some of the other real stuff, the scientific part of it or that, or with your brain or that, you know, I, I need to connect a little bit more. So don't be afraid to look to some other resources that support what the Word of God already says to help broaden your thinking. Dwayne Sheriff has an awesome book on identity theft. I've been reading through that, and I've, I've got a long way to go. I mean, you could talk for hours on this. But I want to know more about this. The enemy's out there to steal who I really am. I want to be educated on some of his tactics from somebody else who's already done a deep study. Okay? This is my, my cheat book, you know? 
And then he's got great scriptures that back it up. So if you want to go deeper, this is an awesome book, okay? For those that want to continue to work on get, renewing your mind and getting your thoughts straightened out, but you, you enjoy little devotional books. Some of you have maybe heard of Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Um, she's, uh, I, I don't know how to explain her, but she's, uh, she's amazing with everything. She's with the brain and the studies she's done and everything. She speaks everywhere. She's written several books. And she's one book she's written is Switched on Your Brain. But um, I've, I've started reading some of this. I bought it a while back. But she goes into the practicality of the Word of God and the practicality of the way your brain scientifically functions, the way God designed it to, go, to be. And she gives you um, an understanding of it. And me, I like to understand why I think and do things the way I do and and then incorporate what the Word of God is saying. And, you know, it just it just adds more meat to it for me. It, it kind of like empowers me even more. Like, yeah, somebody's out there proving the Word of God with science. That's so awesome, you know? And it just backs it up. So I've, I've started reading that, and, and she talks a lot on it. But this little devotional I just got lately, because it's just short little things where it focuses in on your thoughts, and she'll take a scripture and give you a practical thing, and and she'll do some teaching on it, how just even toxic stress and stuff will actually even reduce parts of the size in your brain. It does, really? I don't want toxic thoughts. I don't want my brain shrinking, you know? <laughs> so I've been really enjoying this, so... If you're wanting to know more about your true identity in Christ, take time to research people that you truly trust, that are godly people, that use the Bible and support it with the scriptures that you're, lose, you're using to um, renew your mind. And it will just strengthen you and give you more of that full support and understanding. And that. Don, do you have something there? You look like you're pointing at something before we close out. Uh, yes, if, if you want to write these scriptures down, um, they're good ones to research about how you find your true identity. Ephesians 4 and 24, it says you have a brand new spirit or slash nature in him. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, we are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. 1 Corinthians 6 and 17. You are one with the Lord, identical and complete. Colossians 2 and 10 says you are complete in Him. 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, you have the mind of Christ. Am I going too fast? 2 Corinthians 2 and 21, we are righteous in Him. Mm hmm. That's one thing I had trouble with all, all these years is thinking of myself as righteous. But as long as I'm in the Lord, you know, and, and um, I've accepted the Lord, then I have a righteousness in me. Your, um, your spirit knows all things found in Colossians 3 and 10. Christ lives through you, Galatians 2 and 20. Put on the new man, Ephesians 4 and 24. Your life is hid in Christ, found in John 4 and 24. Your spirit is sealed. And this is the one I love. Your spirit is sealed, Ephesians 1 and 13. Walk in the spirit, Galatians 5 and 16. You're sanctified and perfected forever, Hebrews 10 and 14. Amen. We found a lot of scriptures on this topic, didn't we? Amen. Didn't even get Tons all of them. Of it either. You could you could go on and on <laughs> with lots of them. So what do we do tonight? We talked a little bit about our true identity. Where we're going to find it at? Where we're going to find it. Where? Where? In the, In the Word of God. Yes. Okay. And then once we find it, what should we do with it? What are we going to do with it? 
think about it, meditate on it, let it renew our mind. And what's that going to do with our thoughts? Okay, it's going to change things, going to change our behavior. We're going to find our identity in the word. It doesn't happen overnight, people. We have to do it over and over, right? That's what renewing is. All right. Don, would you like to close us out in a word of prayer? Lord, I'm so glad that we were here tonight to worship you and to learn of your word. I pray, God, that each and every one of us will really realize what our true identity is and that we will stay in the word of God and and dig deep into the word of God and let it just saturate our spirit our and so that our soul and our mind our uh, bodies can come in line with your word God I thank you Lord for having had this opportunity along with Lori tonight to speak and I give you praise and pray that you go with us all for the rest of the week and that we come back here Sunday fired up and ready to worship you in the spirit and in truth. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Don.